uh, call our meeting to order, and uh, we will begin with the, the Pledge of Allegiance. If everyone would please rise and explain them in, me in the pledge. No, you don't have to get up. Okay. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. See, you guys can't see if I got a flag outside the window here, so I to look outside. So. All right. Um, I would I would move that we uh, move uh, Anro's uh, presentation up to the front of the agenda. Um, seeing it's up on screen and everything else, um, and everybody has a chance to look at it or has had a chance to look at it. Um, is there a second to that motion? So moved. Uh, been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. All right, Amro, it's yours. Thank you so much, Jerry, and good afternoon to you all. And thank you for the opportunity to come back and give you an update on where we are with the raw water improvements project. It's been uh, a lot of work has taken place over the last uh uh, you know, nine, ten months since we've, you know, given a presentation and uh, to to the board, um, and you uh, authorized us to begin the proner engineering design effort. So this presentation um, kind of summarizes the design concept that we put together. There are a lot of details in here. Feel free to to uh, you know. Uh, stop me at any point given the pre uh, during this presentation to ask any questions or make any comments. Uh, this is uh, meant to be very interactive. So um, let me know when you, if, if you don't see the slides moving, I'm on the agenda slide. Uh, so why don't I just give you some background uh, on the drivers and the objectives of the project, summary of the improvements, and some of the various design elements, talk a little bit about permitting and schedule. I'm sure cost is on everyone's mind. I will we'll touch briefly on that as we ink in kind of our final, uh, uh, you know, prone engineering report document and, and the cost. Uh, but we wanted to make sure today that what we're presenting, uh, that we haven't missed anything that the board has any questions or concerns about. So why are we doing this project? You probably have seen uh, something similar to this before. Um, and you've heard this from Joe and Bill. Um, uh, there are a number of challenges with the existing raw water system. Um, uh, the existing 30-inch intake uh, is over 100 years old. It, it's, it's really uh, getting to the point in where it's at the end of its, its useful life. Uh, there is also a capacity issue in terms of what your projected demand um, uh, are looking like uh, AECOM did a comprehensive, well, well completed uh, uh, demand study that looked at the need for the system over the next 50 years, and essentially neither intakes, um, uh, uh, if one goes down, that you're able to meet max day or even average day um, with the with the 30 inch, which I've just said is, is over 100 years old. In addition to the intake issues, there's really reliability problems with the existing raw water pump station. Um, DNR has pointed out that these motors are below lake levels, uh, and so if there is a flooding or, uh, you know, water damage into into the pump station, to the motors, uh, that could be challenged to get water out of the plant. Um, they also have a priming system that's, that's had a lot of challenges over the years uh, to be able to get water out of the pump station. So for all these reasons, capacity condition of reliability resiliency that the utility is embar embarking on a very important project uh, to to uh, reliably bring water into the treatment plant um, so uh, I know we're going to talk about a lot of numbers uh, but uh, you know this uh, kind of a little bit of a boring slide but but it, it sort of helped establish what the basis of design is what are the guiding principles for this pump station um, as we look at uh, the intake, this is this is an intake that should last you 
at least another 75, not 100 years like the existing intake. So we got to be able to have the flows uh, that are projected in that demand study that AECOM did. So we looked at the high demand projection because we want an intake that could bring uh, that much water. As far as the pump station, we want to have the pumps as is right now to meet the rated capacity of the plant, but also have the ability in the future to go above this 34 MGD. I'm going to talk a little bit about that with the new design, that we could actually go um, as high as 50 MGD um, if, if, uh, if two of the smaller pumps were swapped with larger pumps. Uh, the next thing we look at is lake levels. Obviously, uh, with lake levels changing over time, um, some years they, they, they may go below historical record lows, some they may go above historical high, and that has a lot of implications on the design of the pump station. So we don't want to just rely on historical record, uh, but we want to go give ourselves a little bit of a safety margin. So in this case, we went one foot above the historical high, uh, and we also went 1.4 below the historical low, and that was really based on a good document that was put together by Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change that looked at what these lake levels might look like. So flows and lake levels really dictate uh, what this pump station design capacity would need to have. Um, this is a schematic. Uh, you can see we've got our new intake. We want to also plan to, in the future, that um, an emergency intake could be extended out in the lake if you know, um, the old intakes are abandoned over time. We also want to bring our filter backwash water. Um, this is reclaimed water that can come back into the head of the plant. Um, and as it goes into this pump station, we've got two traveling screens that take out any large objects to protect the pumps um, and the equipment that we have inside the pump station. Um, and then four vertical turbine pumps, uh, two smaller pumps, and two larger pumps, and that the two smaller pumps um, allow you to meet the low flow conditions so that um, if you, if you um, in the winter months when you don't need to put out as much water, you don't want to waste a lot of energy by having just only a little bigger pumps. Um, so this allows you to meet the demands that you currently face. But in the future, um, you could have four larger pumps um, and essentially each of them is about 16 to 17 MGD. So even with one pump out of service, you could really push 50 MGD. Um, so, so that's why, you know, this pump station allows you to meet not just current needs, but future needs. Um, and then different valving arrangement, flow, meter, and then that connects into what you see, the existing plant um, with the three basins, the east, the west, and the south. Uh, you might recognize some of the features on the, the existing site. Uh, this is the old suction well over here. Um, you could see it started to border the old plant uh, with the existing raw water pump station. Um, this is the existing outfall where that big storm sewer uh, line that the city public works um, put in not too long ago. And um, we located the pump station generally within the area that was originally um, acquired by the utility as an easement um, in the um, this dashed line over here you can see that's the old easement that was acquired by the utility um, and the pump station we moved it a little bit west to provide more protection um, from the lake uh, so we pushed it roughly another 10 feet we're trying to optimize the location of the pump station. You can see my cursor moving. This is sort of the limits of the pump station to try and optimize it so that we are as far away from the lake as possible for, for protection, but we're not building into the hill. You can see these, this is kind of a elevation contours, and you can see here we start to go up the hill 11 all the way to 32. So we're trying to minimize costs by excavating into the hill uh, which would also mean a retaining wall. So that's why we kind of optimize where to locate this uh, pump station. Uh, what you see here is the electrical transformer um, that uh, we would have to get from Alliant Energy to power the new pump station. Um, I'm going to get into a little more details of the layout of the pump station. You can see our two traveling screens for pumps. Um, 
and um, um, essentially this is the electrical room and this is to house two backup generators inside the pump station. Uh, this is a small chemical room for potassium permanganate feed. And this is extra space, you know, a pump station of this uh, size, you, 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 you need some room for uh, normal O&M operation and maintenance, uh, store uh, some items. And in the future, if you wanted to use this for additional uh, chemical systems or anything extra, this, this space uh, could, be, could be utilized. Um, we've also allowed for uh, kind of an access roadway that wraps around the station for access and for maintenance. Um, so this, this layout sort of optimizes uh, not making a lot of changes on site with the utilities, not building into the hill, staying away from the lake as much as possible so that uh, we can build in this resiliency um, and the long-term flexibility. One other thing um, I wanted to add, uh, uh, you know, um, in the future, if the utility decides that, you know, you want to have a brand new treatment plant, um, you know, a couple of miles away, this pump station is very much standalone with, with its intake system. Um, it's not dependent on anything on site. Um, and the pumps are designed so that another stage can be added to any of these pumps to put out more pressure so that we can go further away from um, that we have enough energy to be able to, to, to push this water further out into, into the city. Um, so a lot of kind of independent uh, uh, setup so that in the future, if the utility decides over time um, to, to uh, put, locate the plan, you know, uh, further into the city. Um, yes. Can you, can you comment on the, uh, how, how, relative to lake level, where are the motors for the pumps now in, in this new design? So, so the finished floor is going to be roughly about um, about 10 feet or so uh, above that. This is the nice thing about vertical turbine pumps. It allows you to put the motor up on the finished floor, and the actual impeller would be submerged into into the wet well. Okay, so, so these are pumps again, and I had forgotten that. That's, thank you. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think I might have a section that might get into some of these um, elevations, but certainly both from a lake level as well as we also looked at um, the historical 100-year um, flood elevation in the area. Uh, wanted to make sure with the motors well, well above um, uh, above those those historical levels. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Yep. Um, this is uh, kind of a layout specifically of the building. Um, I mentioned the four pumps. Um, this is uh, has the two screens. Uh, this is a little chemical room for, for potassium permanganate. This is for zebra muscle control, um, uh, sodium permanganate, I should say. Um, and then um, these is the two backup generators. Um, so if you lose power at the plant uh, or the pump station, you'd have the ability to power uh, a couple of pumps to maintain flow into the system. And then this is the electrical room um, that has the motor control center as well as the variable frequency um, drives for, for the, um, the four pumps. Um, um, I mentioned this before, for the new pump station, it's, it's located obviously within uh, uh, the park, within Volarath Park. Um, it shows, again, the kind of the current limits um, for the existing easement. Um, we are going a little bit outside the easement in, in those uh, red um, uh, lines. And again, the main reason for that is, is we push the pump station a little bit further west um, to allow that access driveway to the east and to get it away from the, from the lake. But generally speaking, you can see this is not much bigger and not much different than the original easement that was acquired by the utility, which is the 60 by 120 um, uh, area. Um, if you are interested in the architectural considerations that are the architectural design, our architect um, looked closely at some of the existing buildings on site. 
uh, not just in terms of the uh, uh, you know exterior facade and the brick, but also looking at the different roof systems uh, that do give um, the plant uh, you know very much kind of a unique look to it. And and given we're locating this in the middle of a park uh, with a lot of residents residents and and you know uh, overlooking um, this pump station, we want to make sure that. Uh, that's, uh, that we're matching not just the exterior look of the other building, but also providing something nice for people to look at. So generally, you know, um, you know, masonry, exterior, uh, glass blocked windows, um, and cast stone accents, and then, and then, you know, for the foundation, concrete foundation, obviously. Um, we did a lot of, uh, uh, you know, we, we relied heavily on technology and, um, you know, 3D design, uh, prepared different uh, schematics that, as we presented this to, to the city, public works, planning and zoning. So I'm just gonna go through a couple of, of views of the exterior of the building, what this would look like. Um, uh, this is kind of from the, from the pump station side of things or from the plant, I should say. Um, if you're standing here where the plant is, the lake to the east, um, you could see what the, um, on the south side of the building, what it would look like. And then I'm just going to give through on the other sides here, um, you know, uh, what the exterior of the building uh, would look like. This is on the east side. Um, and then this is looking over, uh, over on the, the you know, high point of the park, looking down on the, um, on the finished uh, uh, roof um, uh, in the exterior of the building. So, um, I'm just moving on to to schedule. Um, we've we've completed the draft, but we wanted to incorporate the input of the city planning, zoning, as well as um, the the utility staff to make sure we uh, we address all those concerns, as well as the overall cost of the project. We have received input uh, from DNR throughout really the project. They were involved in uh, a number of early design workshops. We did get comments from them that we we've, we've addressed with them um uh on the on the design mainly dnr is concerned about the screens the pumps uh from a from a permitting perspective we've also met with planning zoning they really have had no objections uh we've met with the public services commission which ultimately would have to approve this just given their there is a rate impact um and they really thus far have had no objections on the project um you know obviously they Still need to review the different elements of the project and um, and, 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 and to provide input. And the same thing with the Army Corps of Engineers. Anytime you have a major infrastructure project in the lake, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers also needs to be to be involved. And so far they've had also no um, no objections as well. So um, as we em embark on the detailed design uh, we have a very good design concept that we um, that we can utilize. Uh, we feel very comfortable with the schedule. Um, uh, about a seven-month design schedule, detailed design schedule, uh, that CDM Smith and Donahue will be collaborating on. Uh, we will have multiple design workshops with with utility staff, uh, probably after the kickoff again in January, March, and then in May, before we finalize this design and issue out for permitting. Uh, to the different agencies, uh, because we've had uh, input from the different permitting agencies. None of them have been surprised or will be surprised uh, when this shows up on their desk with a permit application um, uh, in, in next year. Um, and um, you know, we've we've always thrown around kind of the spring of 2022 to the fall of 2024, about a two and a half year construction schedule, and this is very very doable. Um, essentially, we're allowing two seasons for the contractor uh, to to complete the intake work, which is which is very doable and consistent with what we've seen from you know with other large intake projects on on the lake. Um, so, with that, I know I went through a lot of slides very quickly. I'd be happy to take any questions or comments from the group. I have a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, with the potential for adding another stage to the vertical turbine pumps in the future for increased lift, will the switchgear and associated cabling for the motors be sufficient 
so that we don't have to install new switchgear and new cabling and so on? That's a very, very good question, Jerry. So um, uh, the items, if, if, if we do have to go to uh, the motors, would have to be replaced. The variable frequency drive would have to be replaced. Uh, but the electric service into the pump station and the cabling, we would size those to be able to handle the additional um, the additional power requirements. But but some some components will have to be replaced when um, when we go to the higher horsepower motor like the VFD and the motors. Um, but we the major items that we don't want to replace like the electrical duct bank and the cabling, we would want to design for 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 those higher horsepower. Great. I wouldn't want to have the larger motors installed right away anyway. That'd be less efficient, and we don't need that. Um, exactly. Traveling screens. How much, Bill, Joe, how much experience do we have with traveling screens? Any? Uh, we currently don't have any screening on any of the suction side of our pump or on the suction wall itself. Uh, we sat through a webinar with a few of the folks from uh, the screen manufacturers, so we've got a little bit of knowledge, no hands-on working knowledge. Um, they, they are there to protect the pumps from any kind of large debris that may enter into the shore well. Um, some of the research stuff that we've seen and done, it's saying that they're practical. Um, there are necessity to protect the pumps and the impellers. The only suggestions I would have for you, based on my experience with traveling screens, is that you will have maintenance associated with them. You probably have to, um, you probably have to do uh, cleaning in the screen wall to clean out zebra mussels on a probably an annual basis, I would bet. And Wisconsin DNR will have uh, considerations for how the aquatic creatures are returned back to the lake. Just something to think about. It's it's. Um, I have every power plant on the lake has traveling screens, so it's nothing unmanageable. But if you don't have experience with them, I don't want you to be surprised. Okay. And uh, that's all. Those are the only other questions or comments I had. I'd love to take a, take credit for the technical questions that, that Mark had there, but uh, I've got one on, on the location of the of the new building and things like that. Um, what are we talking about as far as uh, protection, fencing, um, that type of thing? Or it hasn't been, been, been a, a topic that's been discussed as of yet? It, it's an excellent question, Jerry, and I, I, uh, I uh, neglected to, to, to mention that, so I apologize. Um, if you can still see my screen, this is the site plan for the, the pump station and the transformer. We're proposing a screen uh, that would wrap around the entire site, including the access uh, road um, around the pump station, so you can see the X's. That essentially represents, um, you know, uh, wrapping around a, a fence with gates um, near the, the existing gravel road uh, that would give the utility protection um, and, and potentially could also be access uh, with the utilities brothers and sisters of the park department um, uh, if they wanted to access that. Um, you know, we're, we're cognizant of, you know, we're right near this uh, uh, Frisbee disc golf course uh, with, with, you know, uh, you know, potentially, you know, you know, um, park folks uh, near the pump station. So we wanted to provide that, that fence protection. Okay. Yeah, and if uh, I'll add on to that, we plan to have uh, some security systems like a door fob system. Uh, we'll have intrusion alarms built into the SCADA system. We also have security cameras uh, on probably the four corners of the building, and all of that information we brought back to the operator control room. Okay, great. Thank you. Jerry? Um this is David Beebel, Director of Public Works for the city. Um, I'm at the, I'm, hi. hi, I'm at the council chambers. Uh, in, uh, I just got a quick question, if you don't mind, um, that with the building, do you, do you have enough head, head room 
for rigging and ultimately future maintenance if you have to pull pumps, shaft, impellers, uh, the traveling screen, for instance, uh, that you necessarily don't have to have a future roof penetration to, to do maintenance. Yes, uh, Dave, thank you. That's a good question. Um, yes, if you, I did not include a vertical section of the pump station, but we do have a bridge crane that would allow lifting of uh, pump motor components as well as components of the traveling screen, uh, lift them and, and be able to, to take them out of this um, overhead door. Um, uh, there, uh, we are not planning on any um, um, access, uh, essentially skylights through the top of this pump station. Everything is, is being uh, removed with, with a bridge crane system. Even the traveling screens, because they can be pretty long. Yeah. Th th that's, that exactly is what dictated both the height as well as the size of the bridge crane. Oh, okay. they, the, uh, the system we're using, Mark, um, is an Evaqua, which uh, uh, that used to be part of U.S. Filter Siemens Water Technology, and then Evaqua acquired the the traveling screen. That was that is one of the manufacturer we're talking to, um, and we we actually that was one of the key. That, that's what controlled the sizing of the bridge crane system. Is looking at the longest dimension for uh, when you disassemble the bridge crane that controlled both the weight as well as. Uh, the height restriction. Okay, so Bill, there's future maintenance on your overhead crane required too. Annual maintenance on yeah, uh, we 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 do have a bridge crane in our high lift and low lift pump stations now, and we have to have them inspected annually. So no, that's something that actually we're pretty familiar with. So okay, good. Those traveling screens, as I recall, too, they do come apart in panels. Um, yeah, they do, but if you ever want to get at the lower bearings. <laughs> Did I answer your question, David? Yes, thank you. No, you were kind of in and out there for a little bit. Can't hear you, Joel. It looks like Joe is, is, is inside now. You're not in a car. We can't hear you. Now you're not muted, but we can't hear you, Joel. May need to select a different speaker. So you decided to leave. <laughs> now we did it. Dave, are you still there? Jerry? I guess not. Okay. The, were, you, yeah. are you, were you talking to me? I just wondering if you had any other questions. I, I don't have a I, I don't have a question. Um, I have a, a comment about the project and its importance to the to our city and our and our long term viability and future resiliency for our water supply system. So um, you know, when, it, when it's appropriate, I'd like to make some comments on, on my support for this project and the importance, um, not only to our community, but the long-term viability of our, our, our water system. Thank you, appreciate that. There's Joel. Still muted, Joel. Still can't hear you, Joel. Ah, technology. <laughs> I don't know, do you have any other comments or? No, I, uh, I just want to thank the utility staff, Joe Bill and their entire team. I mean, this, this, uh, for their patience and, and, uh, you know, uh, and, and, you know, despite, you know, when we started this project, I think a month after that, we got hit with COVID and, uh, <laughs> And, and they, uh, they've made this project very easy on the team, uh, given a lot of good uh, comments, uh, a lot of ideas. It's been a very good collaborative effort. The layout that you see up on the screen, by the way, is not the first layout we came up with. Uh, and uh, 
but I think it is the best layout that would uh, meet the multiple challenges and factors in this uh, with this uh, project. So, um, and that's that's what happens in a preliminary design. You really need to to to, to uh, you know, no idea is a bad idea, and you need to consider all the different uh, ideas. So. Um, that's what made this project interesting and and a uh, great team to to uh, uh, to work on it. So just wanted to say thank you to everyone. I have one more question. With the you're, you're collaborating with uh, DPW or Parks as far as the um, the movement of the, the Frisbee Golf Course um, and that stuff. I I know one of the things in your slides shows a different uh, different locations. So. Has that been approved already by the, the city, or? Um, the the uh, uh, that, that's a very good question. Thank you, Jerry. And I, I again, I would want to just compliment uh, Dave and, and everyone at Public Works in the city for for working with the utility staff and, and CDM Smith and Donahue. The only thing we're relocating is one of the holes for the golf course would be relocated. Um, uh, and and you know we're trying to minimize minimize uh, impact uh, uh, you know on the overall use of the golf course. This would have to maintain access during construction. Um, I I don't know that we can say it's been um, you know right now. I think I think uh, there are no objections or concerns, but uh, uh, we are planning to. Uh, uh, under the leadership of Joe, we're trying to we're going to make a presentation, uh, perhaps to the Park District Board, just to make sure. But I I don't want to I don't know that we can say we have all the approvals. Uh, but it's just one one hole that we would be relocating, um, and and we have some ideas um, on on where that hole would be relocated to, um, and it's something we can work through during detailed design. Uh, but yeah, I think I think we are going to make a, a, a presentation or uh, a proposal, essentially, to the Park District Board, essentially, that would uh, approve this. If I'm not mistaken, Joe, is that correct? Well, first of all, do can you guys hear me now? We can hear you now. Okay, sorry about that. I think uh, as far as relocating the whole. Uh, the Public Works Department has indicated they they would uh, prefer us to work with them about that issue. So I think the next step is for uh, Amru and myself to make a presentation to the Common Council. The mayor had requested that we do that at the appropriate time. And I think once we have the issues uh, addressed that the board may raise today, uh, would be the appropriate time to make that presentation to council as, as the next step. Um, so I think uh, one of the big approvals we have yet to gain is the construction authorization from the Public Service Commission, and that is more like a six to eight month process. So that's going to be the big uh, issue for next year once we have final design, we have to get that into the PSC for their, their very detailed review and authorization. Um, you know, one of the things they're especially looking at is, is expenditure. What are we spending money on and can it be justified? And I, I think I wanted to take a little step back and just say that, you know, we began this project with a, a targeted construction cost of about $29 million. And that was determine, you know, looking at rate impact, looking at uh, the cost of, of funds and looking at what we thought was a reasonable estimate. Um, so we started out with the project and some core needs. What, what do we need? And, and the core need is the primary new intake. Uh, and that led into, you know, well, what do, what do we want? And we had a lot of other items that all of which are, are beneficial. And I think then we rounded back to what, what can we now afford? And I think what you see here today is really the culmination of all those issues. I, I think we're getting what we need. I think we're getting what we can afford. And I think when we bid out the project, we'll want to include several alternates just to see, you know, maybe we can 
maybe we were in a beneficial bidding environment and we can afford a few of the other, other items that we might want, but don't necessarily need at this point in time. Um, so I think that's uh, kind of important to, uh, to realize and, and the funding is running in parallel with this project. It's such a large project that we have looked at various funding options and are continuing to do that. And one that's emerged is the FEMA brick, you know, building resilient infrastructure program. You know, that's a grant program of up to 75% of a project cost. Might we receive any grant monies on this project? You know, we don't know, but that would have a big impact on, on the budget and what we can afford. Um, but all those things are still running in parallel along with our, our local input uh, working with the Public Works Department on, on the impact of All Rest Park and, you know, still tying this in with the future of the utility and, and where, uh, where we want to head down the road. So I think, you know, a lot of work, although the preliminary design now looks, you know, fairly simple, a lot of, of work has gone into kind of this, what I feel is really an optimized solution for the project. Great. Any other questions for Amro? Uh, none for me, thank you. Tom, anything on your end? No, I'm good. Okay, all right. Thank you, Amro. Appreciate your time and efforts. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day and great evening. Thank you. Thanks, Amro. Nice job. Stay warm. <laughs> you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amro. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Moving on. Um, next on our agenda is the election of officers for the coming year. Uh, Tom has been reelected to the, the board uh, by the Common Council. So um, we now have uh, to elect our slate of officers for the next year. Any thoughts or comments? Nope. None. I think you're doing a bang up job, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hey, second now. <laughs> you're doing a great job, sec uh, Secretary. <laughs> well, we, we need some motions uh, to, uh, uh, I guess, um, I don't know if there's anybody else in the audience or anybody else that wants to chime in. Um, Otherwise, we need a, a, a motion to um, uh, provide a slate of officers for election. Well, I move that Jerry continues as the president. I second that. And I would move that Mark continue as secretary. I'll second that. All right, we've got two motions out there. We'll combine those two and um, all in favor of those two motions. Aye. I guess I need to ask, are there any other nominations? Any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? Uh, hearing none, um, all in favor of the two motions say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. All right, Joe, you got those down in minutes? Oh, Mr. Secretary, you got those down? Uh, yeah, I'm taking I'm taking notes. I'll send my notes to Jerry and uh, Joe. Joe, and Joe can put it with him as he wishes. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Financial reports. Uh, we have to look at the minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Approval of the minutes. I skipped right over there. Approval of the minutes of our September 21st meeting. I move that we accept them as written. I will second that. All in favor say aye. 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 Fair votes aye. Now moving on to financial reports. Everybody should have received a copy of the financial reports um, by email. Um, any questions or comments for Joe? I had none. Tom, anything from you? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, I just make my normal comment about I just uh, you know the fact that we still have a positive return on rate base um, to me is just uh, that's important that we maintain that. Um, and when does our uh, when does our rate increase go into effect, Joel? October first. Okay. So I did already. Yes. Right. So those those numbers should go up a little bit, although our usage is way down. So. Um, All right, is there a motion to approve the financial reports? I uh, shall move so. so. Jerry, you got that? I've got that. Is there a second? I'll so. second it. Okay. I'll second. All in favor say aye. 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 Have you all signed the approval of vouchers? Joe, did you get everybody's signature? Uh, I have it now, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, superintendent's report. No. Well, I'll uh, just start with operations briefly as presented by, by Supervisor Swearingen. We did see an, an increase in September of about 2% on our high lift pumpage compared to last year. So that's, that's a nice increase. That's going to offset a little bit of the revenue decrease we've seen earlier in the year. Um, so we're happy with that, that outcome. Uh, I don't think otherwise we had a fairly normal September, a lot of ongoing maintenance. Um, we had a, a fair amount of activity out at the Georgia standpipe, uh, as we're working with the contractor who's been painting that and, uh, you know, making plans for what we're doing with the, some of the equipment out there as well. Um, there's nothing else that really is, is outstanding for September, just a lot of ongoing maintenance in the plant, getting ready for winter. Uh, we did finish the uh, repairs on the shore wall, protection, shoreline protection, and you've seen photos of that, and that was extremely successful. Um, so we we're very happy uh, with that outcome. Um, in distribution, we we're winding down on, on the season's water main projects, Seaman Avenue and Geely Avenue. Um, uh, we did not have any main breaks for September. Uh, several, several taps. A uh, six inch tap for second service at the Bachelor Loft Department. That's a large connection. Um, <clears throat> some typical, uh, I'm sorry, we did have uh, three main breaks, uh, and I was looking at a different format here South 19th and um, at South 22nd at Custer and Mead. Um, and we did replace the valve in conjunction with one of those breaks as well. Um, as far as customer relations and, and fiscal, we had a busy month. Uh, we continue to see fewer people coming to the pay window. Um, <clears throat> a little more on drop boxes, a little more on electronic payments. Uh, we do have fewer customers paying uh, due to lack of uh, a disconnection program. Uh, we're hoping that's remedied here as we uh, put uh, delinquent bills on the tax roll and, and wait for people to respond to that. Um, so we do have more outstanding uh, in collections than would be normal. Again, that's due to not having water disconnection in, in light of the pandemic emergency. Um, so have fewer calls coming into the office, a little less activity that way, but it's starting to pick up and become more, more normalized. Uh, you can see the service techs are back out on the road about the same mileage as last year now. Um, and just a lot of uh, other ongoing activity. Did have a fair amount of social media interest in that Georgia Avenue standpipe uh, painting project. It's, People are interested in that. And if you haven't been out there, it, it really looks nice, uh, even better than in the photos. Um, 
And, that's, and completed that's completed. Uh, well, now they're working on the interior. Right. Okay, but the, the exterior, exterior is done. nearly complete. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, that's the extent of the superintendent's report for today. All right. I would move to approve. I can second that. All in favor, say aye. 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 Moving on to number four, water, raw water improvement intake project, presentation on preliminary design we've had. Do we need to take any action on that? Uh, no action requested at this time. Okay. So do you have any comments on that? Uh, no, I don't, Jerry. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your, your uh, attendance and input on it, so. All right. Um, East space and structural analysis. Yeah, this is a project that uh, uh, we began by doing some some well-deserved maintenance work, cleaning the pro the uh, east basin. This is the large basin that's exposed right on the shore of Lake Michigan. We did a, a good cleaning project, and kind of as when you start cleaning an old car, we saw a lot of uh, concern once we had it cleaned. A lot of cracking that had pro propagated and become larger than we maybe were aware of before we cleaned it. So Bill and I discussed uh, the need to do a, a more thorough analysis, structural analysis of that 1959 structure. And as, as Bill was really in the trenches with uh, R.A. Smith, the firm that did that analysis, I've asked him to uh, write a summary, which you have, and then to just briefly walk walk us through the summary here today. So I'll turn it over to Bill on that analysis. Okay, um, so let's see how I can do this best. I'm gonna pull it up on my screen so it might look a little goofy. I'm going to be reading it through, <clears throat> but I won't be able to see myself on camera. <laughs> so, um, so part of what they found with this report is that the, the structure is. Oh, never mind. They're going to allow me to share. There you go. Perfect. Very good. That worked out. So, everybody can see it on the screen now? Yep. yep. Excellent. So, uh, part, of the, part of the report was to look at the structure itself and its uh, integrity. Uh, I just want to say right off the bat that they feel that the structure is not in any kind of danger of falling into the lake in any kind of immediate time frame. Uh, they, they felt that it's still, yeah, it's still, it's still structurally uh, intact, and um, there's just uh, some some critical repairs that they feel like you know need to be addressed. Uh, they they've outlined those critical repair points, uh, kind of given them a different grade on uh, how severe versus how not severe they are. They've broken it down into moderate, critical and just uh, concrete surface repair. And what was great about the report in its entirety is that uh, they gave uh, linear footage to these cracks. So if, when we are ready to move forward with uh, doing this repair work and bidding it out, a contractor should be able to bid out uh, based on uh, this footage and we should be able to get some very good um, numbers uh, for that. Um, I'll just go here and move on and I'll show you some of the photographs of some of these areas that they felt were pretty bad. You can see some of these critical cracks here. Uh, this is on the uh, ceiling from looking up from the lower level. You can see the crack. If everybody can see my cursor, if that's showing up on the screen. Uh, you can see these cracks here and they've identified those as an area where there's critical cracking. So the water flows um, right to left and then up through these windows to the upper level. This corner here you could see is where they had installed a elastomeric liner in the mid 90s that has completely failed. 
and that liner sloughs off into the settling basin. Uh, does not pass through filtration. We do not witness this liner material even being in or on top of the filters. So I think what happens is some of these particles and materials just settle out in the settling basin. Uh, but this would need to be removed for the future as it's failed. You can see the spalding here in the corner with some exposed rebar. So that is not good. You can see here, this is a critical crack they uh, identified. A critical crack they have identified. Uh, a crack that has occurred again. Um, the crack injection work has come a long way, my understanding, uh, from R.A. Smith. Um, materials and products that are used are a lot better quality that were used in 80s and 90s, so that's good. This would be a crack that they would. Uh, target for repair. You can see this effervescence, which is the calcium coming out of the concrete, and they've identified that that's never a good thing. And there's other photos where this on the exterior and the interior. Most of these are interior of the basin. Here again, you can see this liner that was installed has failed, um, and the concrete here is spalled out, and that is not good. Um, here, can see the exterior conditions of just a section of the wall. So this would be on the south end of the base settling basin wall outside along the lake shore. What you see here, these were the cracks previously repaired and the remnants of that. And you can see as we walk up and get closer, some of the deterioration over time. And I thought that these were some really cool uh, shots here. We asked them to, well, we had documentation of the previous concrete repair work done after the work in the mid 90s and pre. And then they overlapped with current day with these markings. And you can see as a comparison, those areas have begun to fail again. And you're probably wondering, well, why is this blue and green and orange? Well, those are identifying the different levels of failure. So the green being the moderate, blue being the critical, and the orange being like exposed rebar, and those are very problem areas, very much problem areas. Uh, again, another old photo, and then a new that they have identified all these failures. Some more photos of these same areas here. But um, I'll move quickly on to this. So another great thing that was done in this report was a 3D LIDAR scanning. So with this paint and their 3D imaging technology, they could take images like with survey equipment and then project that electronically in digital form, all these cracks. So you, what you're seeing here is a screenshot of one of the drawings that I put into this Word document where they're identifying like these would be the cracks that they would need to make repairs to that they've identified and then associate that with the linear footage that we talked about earlier uh, in this document. So I really thought that that was kind of kind of neat that they're able to do that for all the bid work. And it gives you a good visual of like what's actually happening there. And surprisingly, how many areas of this structure are in pretty poor condition when you think about it as a, as a whole. Um, and this is another screenshot of a drawing that they produced showing like some of the spalding areas that with the shaded region and then cracking again. And this is a little bit more detail from a surface view. So this would be, you know, a floor level. This would be like your ceiling level on top of the settling basin. And again, these lines are cracks that they've identified with their imaging equipment. Uh, this gets a little bit more uh, technology driven here. 
these are those colors displayed on like real life photographs of the structure itself. So it almost kind of brings it to life a little bit with these drawings. I apologize, I know it's hard uh, to maybe see some of these. Uh, I had no way of like really trying to blow it up for any kind of great view in this kind of a format, but uh, hopefully you can see and, and make them out a little bit. Bill, I'm curious about one thing. The ceiling yes. with all the cracks, is this cast in place or this fancrete or what kind of a ceiling material is it? I believe it's uh, spancrete on the top. They're yeah. just panels. And then the, the second one here would be, that would have been poured in place. And uh, because that would have been like a, that would have been the ceiling to the lower level, but the floor of the second level. This is a double decker okay. uh, clear um, settling basin. It's just a point of curiosity for me as all. Well. Sure. Um, so part of what we looked uh, the R.A. Smith to do then was also to give us some alternatives. So we wanted them to break out uh, different alternatives that included what we needed to do. We do nothing. We do just these repairs, A, B, and C just B and C repairs and so on. Uh, they came up with five, six different alternatives and associated that with like expected life expectancy if we were to do those alternatives and then put costs to those alternatives and then uh, the increase in, in life expectancy. So the first one was pretty easy if we do nothing. Um, we just decide we're just gonna let it go. This isn't worth doing anything with. They've associated 15 year life expectancy with that and there's no initial cost. Alternative two, here you can see that they've broken it down, given us a certain amount of items, their costs on how it would be bid and the scope of work on what we would do. That would be say to just re remove the liner and target the moderate, the moderate to critical uh, cracking that we see and make those injection repairs and any kind of spalling. And then they've given us a 25 year life expectancy to that work. The next level up, we would say increase the repair work, which the costs would associate with that and increase, but then they're giving it a 30 year life expectancy. So we're going to spend more money to get five more years life expectancy out of that. And then they continue to have done that. Repair all deficiency, reline interior, 50 years. That would be, say, the platinum uh, platinum scope of work. You're basically trying to rehab the whole settling basin to try and get it to, like, new condition, which comes at a very hefty price here at $2 million. What would it cost to build a new one? Yep, that was actually one of the... Uh, one of the alternatives we wanted to look at that um and i believe that's here based in a reconstruction so then you would see a 50 year uh 75 year life expectancy at 2.9 million dollars so obviously numbers would say we are pretty close to building a new one why would we want to do that right <laughs> um that being said we also you look here at this table with all these alternatives and they break it down. You've got your column for years, You've your alternatives here at each top of these columns. And if we were to do say alternative two with these activities listed up here in 25 years, they would suggest that we would be looking at a base and reconstruction effort and then Again, if you drop down another 65 years, we would be in the same position to have to do more repair work after a new construction. Um, any questions on this table? I know it's I moved maybe a little quickly and some of it might be hard to read and understand. It took me a little bit to try and figure out what they were presenting with this table, but once I did, it was actually pretty, pretty logical, you know, if you can follow it here. 
is how they drop down each of the alternatives in each column and then with the years. So if we were to do nothing, they're saying in 15 years, we should be looking at basin reconstruction. If we were to, let's see here, if I can scroll over. Basin reconstruction next year, uh, 35 or 40 years, we would need to be looking at doing some repair work. So after all of that and looking at all of the alternatives and discussions, what they would recommend based on repairs, extended service life and cost would be alternative number two. I feel like that would be the biggest bang for our buck moving forward if we were to keep the settling basin in service, bring it to a hundred year life expectancy. And in all, it is 50 plus years old. Um, the cost that they're saying associated with that is $505,000. So after that, Joe and I had some internal discussions and I don't know if Joe wants to speak to that a little bit or if you want me to continue or. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in with a couple things. Um, you know, we have two other basins. One is, is older than the East Basin. We have a buried West Basin that dates to 1929 and 1939. However, it's not exposed, it's buried. Um, and we could do a similar analysis on the interior structure, but not on the exterior. And then we have our South Basin, which was built in, uh, I wanna say 2004, I could be a year or two off on that, but uh, it is a basin that uses newer technology uh, and has a smaller footprint and we built that basin for a little over $3 million quite a while ago. I think the East Basin is our, our lowest performer of the three. It doesn't seem to do as good of a job of settling water. You know, these are pretreatment basins, so they, they're basically receiving raw water uh, and we begin the initial treatment process, but the East Basin uh, does the worst uh, compared to the other two. Um, you know, we have all kinds of projects, all kinds of investment needs. I think, you know, we wanted to ensure that, that there wasn't any sort of imminent structural failure coming here. We didn't really think that, but I think we now have that assurance. I, I think uh, as we're looking at different elements in the treatment process. You know, if we invest in this East Basin to get 25 more years out of it, at the end of 25 more years, it's basically a hundred year old structure. Um, so one of the things as we just are looking at some of our core processes uh, and taking a little step back, I, I think it would be good. I, I don't see, and, and Bill and I, I agreed on this, that we don't really see an urgency here to rush into invest a lot in the East Basin, you know, right within months, certainly. Um, I, I'd, I'd prefer to take a little bit of a step back and we now have this knowledge, we have good information to bid it out when we're ready to. But I, I'd like us to um, start a little more focus on, on other parts of the water treatment plant. You know, the, the raw water improvement project, we're basically building a section of, of the future water treatment plant. So we're taking out the shore well, the intakes, the Lola station, and we're, we're building new. You know, we have some, some other elements that are aging as well, and, and we need to now start focusing on what are we gonna do with these other elements and, and during what time frame? So I think kind of in, in that light, I, again, I, I don't feel, I wanted the board to see the results of this analysis, but I don't feel we're in a situation where we need to uh, spend a lot of money on the East Basin next year. We, we did budget some, we didn't budget $500,000, we budgeted 200 something, but 
even there, I just don't see, and, and, and tonight we're not requesting any uh, approval for any expenditure on the East Basin. I think we just want to get a good sense out that it's another treatment process that's in need of some investment at, at the right time. And I don't feel like we're quite certain yet at this point, what is the right time? I assume that uh, any repair of the nature that we're talking about would be O and M versus capital. It would be yes. And I'm also looking at the estimates for scaffolding, mobilization, harnesses at thirty-seven thousand. That seems light unless they're planning on using personnel less. So just just a comment there. Yeah, I think I, I found the report reassuring, you know, concrete. Uh, as I look at that structure, I don't see imminent failure coming. It, it is a raw water structure, so some leakage is, is not desirable, but it doesn't result in a, in a water quality issue because it's, it's raw water that it's mm -hmm. containing and, and treating. Um, so I think R.A. Smith does an excellent concrete analysis they're the firm that analyzed the Taylor Hill structure, and we did invest significantly in, in the masonry out of Taylor Hill. Uh, we still have more to do out there because we haven't yet addressed the, the roof structure or the tank itself, which is an old riveted steel tank dating to 1930. Um, but I think for this evening, I just asked Bill to you know really summarize the RA report um, and, and get that out to the board. And I think we have comfort in, in waiting for a year or so to decide what we want to do. That's not, not affecting our treated water. I mean, Taylor Hill was treated water. So here there's exactly. right. raw water, right. You know, if the East Basin were taken offline, we can function uh, perfectly fine with the other two basins, but it, it, it gives us that redundancy and, and resilience that's certainly helpful and beneficial. Right. Any other questions or comments for Joe or Bill? Uh, none for me. None for me. Excellent job, excellent job. It, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, David Beeble again. Uh, Hi, Dave. If I could ask just a question along that, you know, we you have the raw wastewater intake prod, uh, not wastewater, water intake project. Um, you know, going along this, you know, you're looking and enjoy, I think it's, you're making some great points is that, you know, you're looking at not only just that project, but future projects. And I guess really my question then would be, do, do you have like a long range facility plan that gives planning horizons for, let's say, the next five to 10 years in terms of capital projects, uh, 10 to 20 years, and then 25 and beyond, and kind of tying that in, because one of the things is with the new intake, you're gonna have the ability to, to increase capacity, and what types of other improvements then could that trigger at the plant as well long-term from a capital planning standpoint, I guess. Well, what we have is a, we recently completed a 50 year water demand study, which is kind of the key element. You can't do master planning if you don't really know, you know what you're aiming at or what the target is. So that, that was a key step that we completed. And, you know, the results were a little surprising. It, they showed a, very moderate growth in water consumption, even assuming we pick up uh, wholesale customers that we might not pick up for decades, like Plymouth or uh, Aldridge Chemical or Cedar Grove, a, a lot of these smaller communities. So the first thing we have is, is a good sense of where we're heading in terms of a 50-year demand study. Um, we've done some preliminary master plan analysis you know, some of that was tied in with the raw water analysis to try to determine uh, which elements of the plant we should include in that. Should we keep the existing shore well or rehab it? Should we keep existing low lift pumping station? So some of that planning is really uh, culminated in, in what we have in the raw water project. 
now that we're uh, kind of in sync with that and that's moving along, you know, we've got a need to start master planning a future water treatment plant and what's that, what's, what is that going to look at? And we're not talking five years, but, you know, more like a, a 20 plus year time frame. So we have five year plans of capital investments and, uh, and capital projects and the plant. Um, you know, and as you're well aware, these are ongoing infrastructure investment needs that, that each year, uh, you know, some are easy to plan for and some reveal themselves as, as they go along. Um, so our, one of our uh, goals coming up is to begin that, that master planning for a future water treatment plant itself. You know, as, as we said, the raw water project is a portion of a future plant. So if all goes well, we'll have that completed and operational in, in several years. And then the next logical question is, well, where is the future treatment process going to be and, and when? And the existing plant has good lifetime left in it. It's got, uh, it produces uh, as good of, uh, if not better water than, than any plant on Lake Michigan, but we know it's not gonna last forever. So we do wanna begin that process very soon. You know, we're a landlocked site, that's one challenge. Uh, you know, we always are looking at potential property for a future plant, but we haven't identified that yet. That's another challenge. And with some newer technology available, it, it may be possible to shoehorn a, a future plant on our current site with some very significant modifications. So I guess uh, all of those are, are things that are somewhat in progress and, and still coming. And I think what we're seeing in the raw rotter project is, is the first aspect of that. Great. And that's been in the works for 10 years. <laughs> it's been a long time coming. It's a lot of money. And, you know, if really the FEMA brick, and I hate to say that too much because, you know, we, we have no idea of the chance of receiving any grant money. It's probably fairly low, but it's, it's not zero, so it's definitely worth uh, pursuing. You know, if we were to qualify for grants like that, that would allow us to do a lot more projects a lot sooner. But if we don't, you know, then we uh, have uh, impact on our rate payers that is, is the prime consideration always. All right, David, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. All right. Moving on. Um, any PSC code changes, Joe? Uh, none for this month. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the vouchers? Uh, so moved. I second it. Those yes. are the vouchers we already saw. Joe, those are the vouchers we already saw passed around, correct? That's correct. Right. Okay. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Fair votes aye. Uh, review plans regarding COVID-19 risk reduction. Um, I don't have a lot uh, of new things to report there. We're continuing our plans. We're, uh, seems like every week or two, we have a staff member with a possible contact. We're following up on all those. Um, and we're doing everything we can to keep the virus out of our workplace and to minimize the risk if it were to enter our workplace. Um, we are, will be doing that for the foreseeable future. Have we made a determination on the pay window? Uh, we did close the pay window for this week and we'll see what, what happens with the county numbers. Um, I think, you know, one of the challenges with the pay window, which was revealed was that our customers are coming into that space and they're not masking, even though it, it's, uh, you know, they're requested to do so. Um, 
and that's something where we're not attempting to enforce that on, on people coming in. But we did close it for this week and we'll continue to review that. And hopefully the county will, numbers will start to improve and, and we'll be back with that open very soon. Okay. Um, next on the agenda is uh, setting a time and a date for our uh, next meeting. Third Monday would be the 16th of November. That works for me. I'm good. Joe, how does that work for you? Yep, that's fine. All right, it works for me. Um, so our next meeting will take place uh, November 16th, 3.30 again. Um, I'm assuming it will still be uh, uh, virtual? Yes. Okay. Bill, thank you for all your input. Appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. Yes, good to be thank had. You thank you for being had, Bill. <laughs> all right, with that, we need a motion to adjourn. So moved. I'll second it. All right. All in favor, say aye and get up and leave. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen, aye. for your time. David, if you're still there, thank you.